All right. In today's episode, we are going to be discussing how to find balance in life and in ministry. And um, we're going to talk from some personal experience, but we're also going to talk through a section of Mark and also just talk about how ministers and even just uh, lay, the layperson can find balance in life or in ministry and some biblical principles found in the life of Jesus. So uh, to get kicked off, Dad, do you have any whimsical or fun stories what you could tell to start off a conversation like this? I always got me a story and I always welcome the opportunity to tell one. Uh, when I was a child, many, many, many moons ago, uh, I found the story quite humorous. There was a visiting preacher, a pastor from a different state. I believe he was from Arkansas at the time. That's not really important to the story. Was uh, preaching for us, and he told a story uh, on his wife. She was not present, so <laughs> I'm sure if she ever found out, he was in trouble later. But right. he told this story that was pretty funny. He, he said that his wife um, had this habit of uh, thinking she had uh, whatever disease she came in contact with. Or she was always in, um, in search of what might be wrong. If she, some, she thought something was wrong, she's trying to figure it out. So right. they had gone and visited some friends for dinner. And uh, I guess during that visit, she had found a book. Um, and she was excited when they got back in the car and she said, I have found what's wrong. Hmm. I finally found it. She said, I was reading through that book. She said, I found something in that book that had all the symptoms that I have, every one of them. He said, well, that's <laughs> good. I guess what, what was it? What, what did you find out you have? And she said, I have all the symptoms for something called fatigue. <laughs> He said, something called what? She said, fatigue. He said, spell that for me. And she said, well, I believe it was F-A-T-I-G-U-E, fatigue. He started laughing. He said, babe, that ain't a disease. <laughs> he said, you just read a description for fatigue, not right. fatigue. And so then it became a funny thing for us throughout my childhood to refer to fatigue as fatigue. fatigue. And uh, I've had a little bit of fatigue in my life. And I think right. that plays into what we're going to talk about a little bit here tonight of people that might be experiencing fatigue in one form or another. Yeah. Well, so dad's interest introduced me to a new term over the last uh, few days, something that that he's done a little bit of research on. And so I'm going to kick over to dad for a, a large portion of this episode to, to sort of talk about, uh, t tell the people and tell me as well about what you call compassion fatigue. And especially uh, this relates to, uh, to those involved in ministry and we've, and that doesn't have to be ministry, but that is our contact point with it. And so you go ahead and unpack that for us. You bet, man. Uh, actually, the, the term specifically is somewhat new to me as well. Uh, it's not new on the psychological scene. Um, been around, as I have now discovered, since 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Figley was the one who first uh, proposed this uh, idea of compassion fatigue, as he called it. And it has been supported and, and, and used in, uh, uh, in a wide way since then. But I just became aware of it recently from a pastor friend um, who was going through some counseling. And um, in that counseling, they actually indicated that uh, he showed symptoms of PTSD, which he mm -hmm. found interesting because he'd never been in military. And of course, his brain immediately went to PTSD military. Right. Uh, but we know that PTSD is much larger than just the military. But he didn't really have any first-hand traumatic experiences, wasn't in the military, um, you know, was raised in a decent home. So he hasn't really had a lot of first-hand trauma. But in this counseling, he discovered that he actually had uh, what they would call secondary trauma, which can also create mm. PTSD uh, symptoms. Um, and that secondary trauma is connected to compassion fatigue. Mm. And so 
what they told him was happening with him is that he was experiencing at least some level of compassion fatigue. Now, when I heard that phrase, it, it resonated with me immediately mm -hmm. because I, I have my own experience of walking right. through in ministry where those words perfectly describe what, what I have felt in ministry. So I, I began to kind of just look into it a little bit and I'm definitely no expert on it. So um, I'm just only kind of researching uh, some of the results of it, uh, kind of even to help myself through it. And, and it really ties in with uh, the passage in Mark three, where we were. So reading through the passage and seeing, which we'll do here a little later, but mm -hmm. seeing where Jesus was and he was having to deal with the crowds and deal with, with how to manage them and trying to get away from the crowds and, and uh, that he had to deal with basically compassion uh, fatigue, that he had to deal with the exhaustion that would come mm. from feeling so deeply. In fact, you remember when he healed the woman with the blood, he specifically said that the virtue had left his right. body, uh, which, which left him meant the strength. Like he had, he had become tired, weary, mm. like he felt his strength go out of him. Uh, when he healed. And so if there was ever a man who would experience that. So back to what compassion fatigue basically is, uh, it is basically just a, a condition uh, that's very prone to people who care for others. Dr. Figley initially uh, began to relate it to people in the medical, hmm. uh, nursing and caregiving uh, because they are called upon to have compassion and to care uh, so right. often, so frequently, but yet they can begin, if not balanced, to go through a place of fatigue that can lead them eventually into burnout. So yeah. compassion fatigue is not necessarily the same as burnout, whereas burnout is more of a physical exhaustion that comes just mostly from being overworked. Uh, but you can have compassion fatigue that's not from doing too much physical work it's more emotional it's from the amount of caring mm. the amount of compassion that you have shown uh, that you become weary uh, in this compassion fatigue mm. and so there are levels of it um, that you walk through the four levels or four stages of the person who is compassionate and i'm guessing anyone watching this, whether you're directly in pastoral mm -hmm. ministry or you're in some other kind of ministry, which right. we're all in ministry, regardless of what we're doing and whatever degree within your ministry that you're caring for people, uh, you're going to experience some exhaustion sometimes and, and sometimes some frustration with caring more than what other people care and uh, caring when you feel like no one's caring in return. Yeah. I would imagine that most people, most people can relate to a feeling or a sense of um, recognizing that I'm care. I care too much about this or yeah. I'm, I'm caring too much about a person who's not re returning or, or you get the feeling that I'm just, I'm just exhausted because I, I care so much about a certain individual or a certain thing. I'm, I think most people relate to that on some level, but what you're talking about is a bigger, is sort of a bigger condition right am i understanding that correctly but it's still yeah, something yeah, it's, that someone can relate to i i it's something that any individual can experience mm -hmm. um the the point of the study that he did was specifically people who are in a day by day right uh, expression of compassion of a healing of a helping uh such as nursing doctors um caregivers first responders emt uh, ministry pastors would fall counselors, uh, people who are in a mission and a profession of, right. of helping, they will experience it oftentimes on a higher level simply because of a greater exposure to right. these scenarios in which they must care uh, for other people. But he, he, he described there being four stages 
And the first one's actually a positive one. Uh, it's where we all start. Mm. And that is the stage of the zealot, he mm. called it. So this is when you have the zeal for compassion. Man, you, you're ready to save the world and you're ready to go, you know, feed everyone you can. And you just want to heal wounds. And you're so right. uh, almost idealistic in, in, in your view. And it's, it's exciting. I've lived through that, man. Mm. I remember being in a place in ministry where I longed for the opportunity uh, to be able to serve in this way. So that zealot stage, then you'll find uh, as time goes on, if you begin to experience some fatigue and you don't stay balanced with it, uh, that you will go into a second uh, stage, which from the zealot goes into the irritable mm. uh, servant. So you're, you're still excited, but you're beginning to show some stages of irritability. Um, it's, it's not making you happy all the time anymore. Sometimes you're just frustrated with it. Right. I think we all experience that, but then that can progress into a next stage of being withdrawn. Mm. And so you go into a stage of withdrawal where now you're still going through the motions, but you're just not connecting anymore. And, and you're just kind of showing up, mm. uh, still doing the right things, but just showing up. And then the fourth stage is a very dangerous stage. And he calls it the zombie stage, mm. uh, in which you are literally, your mind is not there at all. It's just complete muscle memory. You're just, right. and in fact, you're, unhappy with the whole situation at this stage you begin to usually uh produce anger uh irritation blame a lot of things that happen when you're just there but you're not there you're just literally right. like the living dead and these can be very serious and people end up needing counseling to to come out of it so then there are of course the things to do to treat it and the things to do to avoid it um, and I'd like to maybe spend more of the episode actually focused on that. Like, okay, yeah. so we identify a problem, but what do we do to actually fix this problem or how might I avoid this problem? And so those things um, uh, we can talk about, mm -hmm. I can just list them and we can come back and talk about each one, however you want to do it. But um, the first one is self-care, mm -hmm. which is important. And also, by the way, very hard for a compassion oriented right. person. Uh, generally compassion oriented person are very other centered. Mm -hmm. And so it's a challenge for them to become focused on themselves, right. uh, but eventually life will force you there mm -hmm. uh, and you will have to focus on yourself. And so self-care obviously is very important, which includes diet, exercise, uh, rest. There's mm -hmm. a lot of physical things that play into this as well. Not taking care of yourself physically uh, will affect you emotionally. It'll affect you mentally. It'll bring you more exhaustion. The next uh, level is to learn to have meditation or devotion. Um, and this is the time when you're pulling aside uh, on a personal level, mm -hmm. uh, just you and the Lord. Um, and there you find devotion and meditation and you recenter, you refocus. Yeah. Uh, you refresh. You also receive compassion from the most compassionate of all, which is our Lord. Hmm. And you get your tank refilled. So this is that second part. The third thing uh, is to find pleasure. Um, so to find hobbies, uh, mm -hmm. to find ways to do something that's totally different from the ministry right. you're normally involved in. Uh, to find a way to uh, actually for a little bit, just forget you're supposed to care about everybody else. Yeah. Um, and just go enjoy nature, enjoy life. My personal favorite thing to do is hiking. Uh, just mm -hmm. get out into somewhere, leave your phone behind, <laughs> leave all the connection behind, unplug. Um, and, and this can happen solo it can also happen with others it just yep. needs to be a time where you're having fun you're unplugging from the burden the weight that you've been carrying you're putting it down for a minute and getting some rest no matter how strong you are no matter what kind of weight you can carry everybody has to rest at some point and, and yeah. if you're smart and you want to manage and be able to keep on on the journey carrying the weight that you need you'll take those appropriate times to rest can, and then can the i uh yeah, sure. Go ahead. I was going to say, if, if I wonder if I could interject on the uh, the self care thing. I think it's important that, or I think as you unpack each one of these levels, I can actually see. Um, this is sort of an aside, but I think it's important. I can actually see how the enemy of our souls, who seeks to destroy us, can use a real need 
to to distort this. So, for instance, yeah. um, you mentioned things like meditation. Well, it's very clear that you said meditating with the Lord, meditating in His presence. But what does the enemy do? He seek he sneaks in through things like like um, these like New Age practice meditation. Where mm-hmm. like you're like finding this higher spiritual plane, and and it's right, packaged yeah. in like this self help kind of way, and then you've got this. Um, you mentioned um, just like unwinding and having fun, doing things that are enjoyable. Well, it can very easily turn into this like hedonic, like like just t- I'm going to take care of myself. And you see this happen into people who, a lot of times they they they've burnt out. And Uh in response to their burnout, they turn into this very self-absorbed, almost like worshiping their mental health, like in like that thing. So I wanted to unpack this because I see like there's a tension here because Christianity has always been other centered. Like you're talking about, it's always you're doing for the good of others. You're sacrificing your own self-interest for the sake of others, but we also see a pattern. I think that's why it's important when we get into our text today, we see a pattern even in the life of Christ of him taking time alone. So yeah. you want to, you want to walk through that tension a little bit and kind of. give Yeah. Me your actually, thoughts on that? And actually those first points lead us to the fourth, mm-hmm. which is right in line with what you're talking about. And the fourth one is to actually uh, selectively find ways to serve and to show compassion. Mm. So you, you need self-care, health, focus on health, rest, sleep, food, diet, um, your health. Take care of the temple. Take care of yourself. Secondly, that devotion time where you take care of the mind, take care of the spirit. You connect with the Lord through your Bible reading, through your prayer. Thirdly would be your hobbies and your pleasure, mm-hmm. uh, just finding a way to enjoy God's creation, uh, obviously all within the con- confines of, right. of sc- scriptural bounds. Uh, I think our whole conversation here today is within that context that mm-hmm. we are talking basically to Christians who right. would as- assume that they're, everything's done within, within the confines of scripture. But the fourth one is what is interesting to me and I think is important, and that is to continue to serve. Mm-hmm. Right. So you would think that if you're tired from compassion and you're tired and you're exhausted from serving, that you should quit serving. Right. But I think on the contrary, um, you should always continue to serve and you will find actually a replenishment of mm. the virtue that we have in the service because we serve with the Lord. And right. so uh, the, the key becomes learning to let him serve through us Mm -hmm. and becoming selective in our service. Let me give you an example. A person who cares deeply, and I I put myself in that group because I'm a very emotional, deeply caring person, uh, can carry a lot of weight. Um, Even listening to the news Mm -hmm. for a person who has compassion fatigue, who has uh, an over, um, uh, an overbent or an over, Uh, He's bent more towards caring about everything deeply. Even listening to the news can begin to weigh you down. You can feel Mm -hmm. the weight of, oh, my Lord, you know, how, how, and you feel so deeply that you have to learn to create some boundaries and to figure out, to choose your burdens, to choose, let the Lord choose your burdens, actually. But through the help of the Holy Spirit, choose the things to care about, and then, Use the things to not care about right? because you've spent so much time caring about everything and too much. And it's a challenge, man. It was a hard challenge for myself, Mm -hmm. continues to be a challenge for me uh, to learn to care, but not care, uh, to figure out what to care about, what not to care about. And honestly, because I'm so passionate and I can care about things so deeply, I have intentionally pulled myself out of political ideologies um, not that I don't listen or study right. or know what's going on, but I don't want in the conversations very often because I can waste a lot of passion mm. on things that may not be where the Lord's directing my passion. Now, right. if it is where he's directing my passion, then by all means be obedient to the Lord, but, but let the Lord begin to, to right. aim and to target my emotions and my compassions to where they should be. Because you want to talk about the most, reinvigorating, refreshing thing in the world is the opportunity to lead somebody 
to salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't care. I don't care how tired you have been <laughs> when you get the opportunity to actually share the gospel. Someone right. embrace that message. So, so service can actually reinvigorate you when it's done spirit directed, spirit led, and not just random caring about everything, caring about people's drama, caring about people's issues, listening to everybody's burdens, um, you got to learn how to even listen to some of that stuff and then walk away and say, Lord, you're going to take care of that when I'm going right. to sleep. Uh, I, I remember as a young man having to learn how to literally write things down and say to the Lord, Lord, you're going to be up all night. You worry about this for me. Right. I'm going to go on to bed and I'm going to get some rest because when you care, now caring is good. And and we're in a society that kind of criticizes people who care about others. Uh, We're in a very narcissistic, very, um, as you said, hedonistic uh, society that's very much all about their self. And, but you realize in the gospel, the gospel contradicts that from the very beginning. If you're going to follow him, you will deny yourself pick up your cross and follow him. Mm -hmm. So self-denial is at the very root of our Christian walk. So we talk here today as Christians, understanding that the ultimate goal of why we are here is to know the Lord and to help others know the Lord. That's our purpose. That's why we exist. So again, it is important to stop and take care of yourself because you can spend so much time. Like I have known of people who cared for others to such an extent they would not get proper rest. Yeah. On a regular basis, it's ongoing, like they would never sleep properly because everybody was always demanding on them and always calling them to do this right. and calling them to do that. And they didn't know how to say no. And so they're just going until they haven't slept. They haven't eaten properly. How could they eat properly before they could sit down and right. plan a meal? Somebody else needs a ride to the store and, and this person needs needs some help with that. And, and, and they just give, give, give. And they're never strengthening themselves to enhance their ability to give. So the whole purpose of self-care is so yeah. that we may serve yep, and so that we may save others first faithfully. And that gets us to that fourth step, which is stay involved in serving. Yeah. Um, well, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I have personally gone both ways on that. And mm-hmm. I can tell you from personal experience, withdrawing from serving is a mistake. Mm. Uh, because because you know you do have to learn balance and that's what we can go into right. beyond this is how to balance and how to how to f- do these things that I'm talking about uh, but at the same time man don't quit serving the Lord because right. that is where we get our joy the joy of the Lord is our strength and we get joy in serving him and yeah. serving others well I think the the point that I that you're bringing out and I just want to say it in another way it's the same saying the same same thing, but Say it, dif- brother Luke. The difference between the self-care movement that the secular self-care movement and the way that the the biblical self-care model, the, the uh-huh. difference between these two is that in the Christian worldview, we need to take time to take care of ourselves so that we are able to serve others. Like the yes. purpose is service. The purpose is not just to just to uh, care for Absolutely. ourselves and, and build ourselves up. The purpose is so that we're uh, at the, we're the most fit mentally, physically, and emotionally to to care for others' needs and be able to actually uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah, and to do it effectively. Right. We can't do it. We can't be the hands and feet of Jesus effectively if we're falling apart. Uh, on the inside. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, th- I think uh, self-love, I interrupted you, but self-love is properly couched within the terms of love your neighbor as you love, as you love yourself. Right. They're connected. Mm-hmm. You, you can't love yourself in actual love right. and not love your neighbor. Yeah. And the, so the difference there, the contrast with the secular movement is that it stops short of serving others. So mm-hmm. if you notice, everything with this, with that sort of worldview is pretty much you exclusively care for yourself, and and you have the co- sort of attitude in our culture, which is, um, I don't want to use use the term that I want to use, but um, fooey on everyone else, <laughs> 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 and, 
and I'm going to take care of myself. Uh, and, and I think that that's basically the attitude that you see in the culture, which is, um, basically I'm doing me, I'm doing me. And yeah, if you're right. not along for my ride and my self-interest, bye-bye and yeah, throw you to the curb because you're not helping serve me. Cause I'm looking out for number one. And the difference between the biblical model is that's not the focus at all. The focus at the biblical model is to say, I need to take care of myself to make sure that I'm strong, to make sure that I'm able to able to properly care for, for the people that God puts in my life, that I can be a service to them, serve them well, while also being healthy. Absolutely. And so it's complete, two completely different things. And I think that a lot of times Christians... Be, uh, I, I, I think it's two completely different goals. Yes. And I think that a lot of times so Christians can be really skeptical of even the idea of say, hey, I need to go, I need to go get help. I need to actually take care of myself. I think that they can yeah. be really skeptical of that because it sounds like the opposite of what we're supposed to do, which is to lay down our own lives to to serve others. And they, they think that, oh, well, self-care, that, that's just not something Christians do. And, and in reality, I think that many Christians, you're, you're on the point of burnout if yeah. you don't take the time to actually unplug from, from everyone else and to go... Um, yeah, you know, if, go if you don't learn to actually love yourself in the love of Christ, right. in a biblical sense, you don't know how to love anyone else. Right. And the only way you can love yourself is to be loved by God. Mm -hmm. Like the only... The only example of true love that's known in our world is the love of God. Right. All human love, it has its place, but it falls short. Right. Um, so, you know, you can talk about the four kinds of love, which is a different subject, but, you know, you got the storge, you got the phileo, you got the uh, eros, and then, of course, the agape. And of those four types of love, um, it was the agape that is the actual selfless love. And so the only way you and I can learn, Luke, to, to love selflessly is through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's through right. our Lord and Savior. So when we love God, think about what we need to do. We need to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our might, all our strength. That's number one. <laughs> number one, the greatest command. Jesus didn't quibble about that. That is right. the greatest commandment. But he said the second is like unto it. So let's get our priority right. Right. Mm -hmm. Number one, love God with everything in you. Right. Now you now you're ready to talk about now love your neighbor how as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when you obey the first commandment and you love God, that's where you receive love and you learn how to love yourself because your value becomes that of the cross, right? Your worth becomes that of how much God loves you. So when you receive the love of God and you love him, you are now prepared to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, I know some people, I don't want them to love me the way they love themselves. Right. Because <laughs> If they if they love me the way they love themselves, I might get hurt. <laughs> they right. don't care much for themselves. But when we love God, what's the greatest commandment? Love God with mm -hmm. all your heart, all your might, all your strength, everything within you. That's where you start. Right. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself, as you realize you were valued, as you realize yeah. you were worthy, as you realize that you have, man, that, that God, God loves you, gave his son for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. That's the way you got to love your neighbor. And yeah. so you love them with the gospel. You love them with this awesome, incredible message that we have of being loved by God. Yeah. And so that's the difference of the whole Christian philosophy, whereas the humanistic worldly culture that we live in, the, it's a difference of worship. It's a difference mm -hmm. of allegiance. They pursue self-care because they worship themselves. Yeah. Well, and it, and and to, to add on to what you're saying there, it is it's a self-worship problem because yeah. they if you were to define what we I mean this is actually probably important. We need to define what does it mean to love yourself? What does it mean to love others? What does what does it mean to love? And mm -hmm. so what you find here is with, with the worldly model, the love is everything that brings me pleasure. But biblical love would say, well, not everything that brings me pleasure is actually good for me. Right. And not everything that brings me pleasure is actually what is best for me. And biblical right. love says, I like, I need to love others as I would want to be, as I love myself. But that means that sometimes just the hedonic search for pleasure 
is actually not love. That's no right. That's a distortion of of Absolutely. love. That's, that's just it's pleasure. lust. Right. It's lust. It's the perversion of love, which is what humans always do with love outside of agape. Right. Outside of godly love, yeah. which is why it's so important. Our world does not know how to love. I don't care how many songs they write about right. it. I don't care how many movies are written about it. I don't care how much that people try to portray love, 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 you know, uh, and all this peace and love. And they, they don't they don't understand right. it. You can't understand it outside of the love of God because your love is always ultimately self-seeking, mm -hmm. self-serving. But when you have been loved by God and you've loved him, it's no longer about yourself. But right. now it's loving him, loving others. And in those two things, you will find the greatest love you have ever found in your yeah. life. And that's what this taking care of yourself is all about. Right. Um, but if you don't take the time to take care of yourself and to remain balanced and to value yourself, mm -hmm. why? Because God values you. Right. And so it's based on that, that knowledge that you have of God and he has of you. He has called me by name. Right. So the value that I have is because he has loved me mm. and because he values me. Therefore, I am worthy. Right. Therefore, I have value. I matter. I may not matter to some right. people in the world, but I matter to him. Yeah. And so based on that value, based on that worth, which is what you need to seek in this uh, attempt to remain balanced in your compassion. And, and by the way, when when you walk in the love of God, it becomes his compassion that you walk in rather than just your own. And that's a big difference in whether you end up exhausted and fatigued or you don't. Yeah. Uh, for instance, now you take um, anybody in a, in a, uh, um, an industry or anybody in a, uh, um, what's the word I'm trying to think? Their job, their uh, vocation. Uh, vocation. Thank you. That was the word. I, I need a vacation. I need a vacation so I could remember vocation, but vocation. occupation, right? Anyone who's in like a helping, healing, occupation, vocation uh, will experience weariness. Now where mm -hmm. ministry takes this to a whole nother level and especially mm -hmm. pastors is they add on to it an eternal Right. tag. So now not only am I trying to help people, but I'm trying to help people be saved from, right. from Satan. And here's the problem is that we tend to carry that responsibility when we ought not to, meaning you and I don't save anybody. Not at all. God saves people. Right. And he's been saving people <laughs> right. for, for millennia. He's been he's doing this He's better at thing. it than we are. <laughs> he, he's doing it before I ever showed up on the scene. Right. He's going to be doing it if he doesn't return for his people after I'm gone. So right. this thing is not dependent on Tim Pixler. There, right. there was a time, and this is important right here, man. There was a time when, when I felt like that God's work was dependent on me. Right. Like, like literally there were things that I had to do because I was the only person he sent here to do that. And then I began to realize, Hey, hold on. Right. If I were to go sit down tomorrow and not do anything else, God's still going to get his plan done. Right. So is he involving me? Absolutely. He's allowing me to be a part of it. He's empowering me. Yeah. <laughs> Whew, I feel well, the Holy ghost talking about it. He's empowered me to do right. his work, but he's doing it. Yeah, and it, he's he's allowing you to be a part of it because it's for your own good that you're involved in it. Amen. So, so you, as the person, get the the benefit and you get the satisfaction of having played a role in yeah. the salvation of another. You didn't you didn't cause anything to happen. No, but he has chosen to allow you to play a part in that. Amen. Because you get as a person, you get so it's all a part of the love of God. <laughs> he extended, loved you enough, right? Yes. He extended he extended the offer of salvation mm -hmm. to a person because he loves that person, and he allowed you to be the conduit because he loves you, and he wants you to receive that that reward. Yeah, so there you go, <laughs> and that's it's, awesome. It's when, pretty when you, amazing. <laughs> And when you realize that, you can take some weight off of yourself that I have to save the world. No, Jesus has to save the world, and right. he's doing a good job of it. He knows what he's doing, well, uh, even, when, he's even if it don't look world. like it. Absolutely, and he is right. doing his job. 
and right. and he is allowing me to be a part of that and right. so that allows me to get some weight off of me yeah. of saying man that's a heavy heavy burden to carry right. like well if i didn't tell that person about jesus they're going to be in hell and they're going to be yeah. calling my name and pointing their finger at me and there's so much of this kind of preaching yeah. that man makes evangelism like oh my god it's such a weight on me i've got to save the world and the reality is no be obedient to the holy spirit he's yeah. going to do it through you but he's going to do it through you or without you he's going to do the yeah. work well, but he's allowing you the opportunity. That's what's yeah. so cool. You see, yeah. you could be you could be a part of this, man. But but, but if people reject him, th right. that's that's not on me. I don't yeah. have to carry that kind of weight. And to bring to bring that into line in the focus of our conversation, because that it, it connects, that we we get to play a part in 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 God's plan of saving the world, but. And there is some eternal weight attached to how we shepherd and how we lead people and how we care for people. Like we, we do have responsibility and how we do that, but it's not on us. It's right. not our, it's not our job to do so. So I know some people, and this is to, to bring it back to our conversation. I know some people who they, they have a, a real fear um, because they feel a real urgency to do missions or to do evangelism, they feel the urgency of reaching the lost. That's great. I I wish that the church would have that burden and that that longing to that urgency that uh, we've got to go. We've got to go see souls saved. We need to get out and be a part of yes. the work. But some people have felt that urgency to such a level that they're afraid to take an afternoon and go play golf or take the time to go on a weekend trip or take the time to go relax. Yeah. And they, and they think that if I don't, if I, if I do that, if I take a vacation, there are souls that are going to, are going to be lost. And, and we're here to say, God's going to accomplish this work. Amen. Whether you're a part of it or whether you're not a part of it. So it's sometimes it's okay to take the time God's still going to save souls. Take the time and go take care of yourself and then get back into the field. Yeah. Um, you don't have time for a vacation if it's your job to save the world. And right. if it's your job to save the world, you are dead gum right. Don't you dare take right. any time off, man. You better stay at better it. You, you've got a lot of work to do right. and, and, and you've got to stay at it. However, if it's God, who right. saves and it's God who does these things. Then you, your friends who are passionate about evangelism, God bless them. I am too, right. man. I'm, I'm on that list of people that are passionate. You know why we're passionate? Right. Because God is saving the world and he puts that in our heart. He gives us that passion. That is him moving through us through the Holy spirit. And so he also can move through me as I am relaxing and Jesus Mark three uh, found himself in this place where you're talking about doing ministry, right? Hey, none of us measuring up or doing any kind of ministry compared to Jesus. And right. he was, he was ministering to everyone. I mean, all over. And he found himself, in fact, in such a press that he was trying to get away from the crowd. He moved with the disciples down to the sea. Now, remember from our previous passage, the, the Pharisees were trying to kill him. Right. That's how that ended was they, they went about to figure out how to get rid of him. And he said, boys, let's go on down to the sea. And right. so, so they moved on down to the sea. But when he gets there, he tells them that get a boat ready. And this is in Mark three, I think it's like seven through 12. Mm -hmm. And so he says, get a boat ready because the crowd is so much. I'm, I, I may get crushed. Yeah, there we go. So, so he says that I may get crushed and we need to have this boat ready to escape. Mm -hmm. and, and Mark says that the reason why that there was such crowds was because of all the healings he had done, all the right. miracles that had happened, man, he had healed so many people. And so the crowd came. And first of all, he says there was a crowd from Galilee. Then he's like, Oh yeah. And from Judea and, mm -hmm. and also from this other city and from Tyre and Sidon mm -hmm. and from here and there, you know, come to think of it, man, the crowd was huge. This from all over the place. And right. they were so many people that he was having to move away from the crowd. And so he takes with him just a key group, of guys. Right. And he goes to teach them. Now, if you move ahead into our next passage, we'll be dealing with in the next episode. You'll see that following this, he actually delegates 
in appointing apostles and begins to delegate out beyond himself because the ministry had become so much, he could not do it all on his own. Now, if Jesus could go away into the mountain by himself, could take a break, and this happens all throughout the Gospels. You can go over to Matthew 12 and see it. You can go different places and see that Jesus went aside, sometimes on his own, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes with, with three guys, take three disciples with him, and a couple times it was just the, the four of them. Uh, you see other times when it was just the disciples, the 12, and he would go away. Now, now what happened? Ain't he supposed to be doing ministry? Aren't right. there people out there that's got to be healed? Aren't there people out Good there, and people that are demon-possessed that got to be set free? Yes. But let's go fishing for a minute. Right. <laughs> but let, let's go take a break. Let's go up in the mountain. What? Why? I, not because Jesus didn't have men. He's full of the Father, right? Right. I mean, there there is nobody with more source of strength than Jesus. But I believe He exampled for us, just right. as God exampled for us in creation: six days of work, one day of rest. And so, and then Jesus example for us in his ministry that I'm going to do these miracles, do all these amazing things, man, we're going to, we're going to bring the gospel to the poor. Uh, but I'm also going to go up in the mountain for a little bit and I'll right. see you guys here in a few days. Cause I'm going to go away, uh, be so that he could example. And also not just, uh, to, because we needed to do that, but he right. needed to do that. He needed to refresh. And, and we find Jesus at times weary. We find him after the temptation when he fasted for 40 days, uh, and there was tempted by Satan. He was afterward a hungered and he was afterward tired and he was weary. And the Bible says the angels came and ministered to him. And so he felt that exhaustion, just, man, I'm going to tell you, serving God sometimes can just leave you right depleted. And yet he was refueled, refilled. And, and, and so I noticed two, mm-hmm. two different ways here. If I can drop this out here for discussion. One is that Jesus often went aside alone. Mm-hmm. And I think we need that alone time much more than many of us take. Right. But he also went aside with people he was close to. So there are times that we need our alone time, but I believe also God would call us to times of community with other believers in a place that they're not demanding on me, that they're not. Mm -hmm. I, I remember standing at church picnics and just wishing I could eat a dad burn hot dog <laughs> without 17 people needing to talk to me about right. problems in their lives. Right. So tired, so weary, so just, whew. Right. I, I had endeavored to do a ministry in, in an area with a lot, a lot of need. And so that need, I was, I was happy to serve, but, but I was feeling that exhaustion and, and Jesus did feel this exhaustion and right. he knew you got to pull away. You got to. So sometimes you need to be alone. Sometimes you need to be with friends. Yeah. Dad, there's a, um, there is a story and I want to interject it here because I think it, you, what you just brought up, it really, really talks, it, it gets to the heart of it. Um, you told a story of a pastor talk. I don't know who it was or, but there was an example with a tooth, a tube of toothpaste. And yeah. can, could you tell that story? Because I think that story really, because it illustrates what I think, I think there's something about that illustration that growing up, I thought that was a great, it's a great illustration. But the more I've gotten, <laughs> the older I've gotten, the more I think that that illustration has a real flaw in it, a real, yeah. real, like it misses yeah, big, the point. Big time. Yeah. Uh, a mentor asked me, uh, I was about 20 to 22, somewhere in that range, early 20s. He asked me, he said, uh, Brother Pixler, mm-hmm. do you want to be used of God? Yes, mm-hmm. sir, I want to be used of God. Do you really want to be used of God? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Took a tube of toothpaste. He said, let me show you what it looks like to be used of God. He began taking that tube and squeezing. It was coming out and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing down until he had emptied the tube and then he just crumpled it up and he showed me that crumpled up tube of toothpaste that was completely empty. And he Mm -hmm. said, that tube of toothpaste was used. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be used of God, that's what you got to be willing to do. Now the problem that I see in this illustration, because first of all, when I heard this thing, I thought it made sense because serving, Mm -hmm. you do empty yourself out. You pour yourself out. But what it misses is the very key, like a very key thing, which is that we are daily filled with the spirit. 
and so Man. and so while we might pour ourselves out we have a savior we have a lord who fills us back up Yes, he so pours we, himself in. <laughs> right, right. So this should be a continual flowing and outflowing Ooh. of the Spirit, in, like a river, like a river of living water. <laughs> Hallelujah. Flowing. Amen. And, yes. And so, um, so I think that it's very important that we, as we serve and as we we love people and as we are reaching out to the community, it's not bad to take care of yourself. Not bad to take some time to to no. make sure. To make sure that you're not burning out, because that you're, that you're getting refilled. That you're getting refilled, right. See, right? see, the problem with that tube of toothpaste mm -hmm. is how quickly did, does that happen? Did that right. happen by the time I was 25? Huh. Okay, well at 20, I'm done then. I ain't right. got nothing else to give. I gave everything I could give, and that and that was it. What a what a stupid yeah. illustration that was. Um, and thankfully, somewhere through that process of the next 10 years, I began to realize that no, right. God doesn't want to just rejoice in the fact that he left me used up like a useless right. rag and tossed me to the side. But no. rather, he said, I'm going to give you a renewing, a renewing, a renewing. Right. it's going to be replenishing, it's right. going to, uh, from from in your belly will flow rivers, rivers of water. living water. So are right. you going to give? Yes, the living water is going to flow for right. it, man, the spirits. Whoo, I'm about to have a Holy Ghost <laughs> fit up in this place right now. The, the spirit is going to come through right. you. I feel it right now, man. I can feel it almost yeah. like, like physically, like yeah. a stool just wants to gush out of me. Right. So that's what the Holy Ghost does, man. Right. You can be refilled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we right. are day by day. We're renewed by the word of God. We're renewed in our mm -hmm. prayer. And we, so we can find that refreshment. The problem is, is you can learn, especially when you start taking too much responsibility on yourself, you can learn to go through the motions and do all the right things without the help of the Spirit. Right. Where we've got to get to is to realize we need Spirit-directed, which gets right. me back to that point four, selective burdens. Mm -hmm. It's Spirit-guided, Spirit-led. So yeah. Spirit, lead me where you mm -hmm. want me to care Help me care right. about the things I need to care about, and you will replenish. Because when, ah, whew, when, when I'm sorry, anybody listening right now, you having to put up with my emotions, but I'm about to have a fit up in this place. I'm about to dance, and I'm about to shout, and I'm about to start <laughs> holy rolling right here in the middle of this podcast. But I'm telling you that when you care about what God cares about, right. He cares for you. First Peter five seven: Cast all your cares upon the Lord, mm -hmm. for He careth for you. Right. He cares along with you. He doesn't just care right. about you. He cares with you. He cares mm. about the things. More importantly, you care about the things he cares about. Right. We spend so much time arguing, fussing, and trying to be right and trying to, to be better than someone else and trying to be more holy. And we argue and fuss about the darndest things <laughs> when, when if we could care about what God cares about. Right. And I'm not trying to tell you what that is. I think you can see through the word what it is. But right. I am telling you, man, pray and let God put in you the burden and the care and the concern and realize you don't have to save the world. Right. He already did. Yes. He yes. already died on the cross. It's a finished work. And so you're bringing the good news to people. You're sharing the good news with people. But man, do it with joy. Do it with rest. <laughs> Don't come to them looking so weary and exhausted and tired and frustrated and irritated and, and under right. pressure to make sure that you get it right, that they don't want anything to do with what you have, yeah. but rather come with the joy of the Holy Ghost in your yeah. life that somebody says, man, I don't know how you feeling that good, but I right. want me some of that. Yeah, and I, I don't want to take up our, I don't want to take up our last few minutes by opening up a theological can of worms. But I think I'm going to open up a theological can of worms. Mm, do it. I think that um, while I am not capital N O T, I am not a Calvinist. I think that we ought to have a healthy view of God's sovereignty in the act of salvation. Absolutely. And so here, the, and where I get to this point is I, I don't believe that God picks and chooses who is saved and who is not. I do believe that there is free free will and choice and all of that. But but the reason that I think it's important is because I think a lot of times we live our lives like somebody's eternal destiny depends on every little minor word that I might say. And if I say something just wrong, that person might miss out on salvation because of my yeah. mistake. Where if we could just 
hold on, pump the brakes and realize that God is going to accomplish the work. Amen. He, is, he is much better at saving people than we are. And yeah. the, the purpose that we are even involved in the evangelism or we are even involved in ministry is not because we are saving people. It's no. because we are participating because it is Amen. for our good. And it's and the it's, privilege. Yes. We, we get the reward of serving. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so if we can if we can have a view like almost like like man, I I'm putting it in God's hands. He's yeah. he's going to do this and and That's yeah. That's the best I, place to put it. <laughs> right. Right. And while I don't believe that he is like he forces people to make decisions. I don't believe that he determines outcomes. I do believe that he is way better at drawing people to himself than I ever will be. Yeah. And, and, it, and isn't that more between God and the person he's saving? Right. Isn't the surrender and the yes coming from the person who's being saved and God right. is using means to, to help that happen. Yeah. If, if, uh, if someone's asking for right. the Holy spirit, um, as a father would give good gifts to a son who would ask him. So the heavenly father will right. give the Holy spirit to them that ask him. Right. And so when someone, and, and God puts it in their heart to seek him in the first place, you don't do that. Right. You don't cause a person to want God. Now you can live in a way that causes them to see him and yeah. then he can work in their heart, but you cannot change the heart of a person. Only no. God can affect the heart of a person. So God moves in the heart of that person and God begins to move them and God involves you and I in the process. Hallelujah. Right. We get to preach and we get to, to right. share the gospel and he does it through his church. Thank the Lord for yeah. it. But, but don't be under the impression that if you were to walk out today, God's church would fall apart no. or at least the, the part that you would, or there would be some people that didn't make it because you wasn't there. There's a tension between God's sovereignty and human right. responsibility. Mm -hmm. They work together. They're, they're like an accelerator and a clutch, right? I mean, they, <laughs> they have a tension. They work together. And, and God's sovereignty is very much involved in the salvation of people, yet he uses human right. interaction. So our responsibility to obedience to God allows us the opportunity to be right. a part of that process. And he's chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save what? Those that believe. Right. The salvation is based upon their belief. Yeah. And he has chosen by our preaching to do that. But if you and I don't preach it, He'll raise up somebody. He said at one yeah. point, if y'all don't praise me, I'll raise up these rocks the over rocks here. Will cry out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he said, I'll, I'll use a I'll use a dad gum donkey if I got yeah. to, man. It oh, I'm saying dad gum and dad burn too much. <laughs> for all you people out there that are that are holier than I am, please pray for me that I'll quit saying dad gum. Yes. But well, the dad gum word keeps coming to my mouth and in my mind, and I keep saying it because I'm getting so dad burned passionate about all of it. Amen. Yeah, so uh, well, turn this thing off. I'm getting carried away. <laughs> yeah, I, I just like I I don't hold to a view that um that God determines an outcome, but I do hold to the view that God well, number one, he desires that all would be saved. Um, so that's his desire. And number two, he's the God who knocked Saul off of his horse with a blinding <laughs> light. I'm and I don't know. I don't know any minister that I've ever met that's no. ever knocked someone down with a blinding light uh -uh. And, and instantly changed their life from persecutor of Christians to an apostle. I don't know yeah. anything, anybody who's had that power. So the God who has the power to do that in him, what are, what are we going? We're not going to mess his plan up. He that's wills it. and works in us. Yes. He wills and works in us, but it's his will. Right, it's his will. I mean, Peter could preach all day long. Uh -huh. He could not baptize that upper room with the Holy Ghost. No. Mm -mm. You, you can do everything you want to do, but you right. can't save that soul. No. You, you can even lead them in a prayer, which many, and that's a whole nother discussion. Sometimes I think maybe that leads to something productive. Other times I think maybe it doesn't. Uh, it just depends on what? The faith of the believer, right. the faith of the heart of the person. So yeah, do do your part, lead somebody to prayer, show them how to pray, You know, lead them into baptism, lead them into an understanding of walking in the spirit, filled with the spirit, all those things. But, but at the end of the day, God is the one building this church. Right. And he wants you to be a part of it. Come on, come on, come on, come with me. Help us build the church. Please, if you're listening to this, 
Right. Get on board, man. Let's build the church, but let's do it with excitement. Yeah. And let's do it with joy. And let's do it with people that values God's value for us and right. the family that he gave to us. Man, he loves marriage. He wants you to spend time with your wife. He loves family. He wants you to spend right. time with your kids. He created family to pour into you. Yeah. You should be getting stronger by spending time with your family. He loves friendship, man. He wants you to have some brothers and some sisters. And mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now, talking with my son, I thank God for my son. He puts more into me than he'll ever Ever realize with our conversations because we can feed one another, man. And so we can take that nourishment that God puts into us. And right. now I'm a more whole and complete person. So that when I talk to the guy at the park or I talk to the individual, the homeowner at their home, and I begin to share the love of Jesus with that person, I'm, I have a full tank to share from right. because I'm not that tube of toothpaste, right? but I am that cup that over run oh, my cup overflows right the, out of my belly flows yep. a river and when you got a belly the size of mine that's a big <laughs> old river right there and, and that flows out of me right. because god has flown into me through yep. his word through prayer through friends through serving don't pull away from loving people whatever yep. you do man don't pull away from it because you're going to love god and god loves people it's yep. it's it's impossible Love God and not love your neighbor. Right. Right. I, and I'll say that again. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. John said, who in the world are you crazy people trying to say yes. you love God that you haven't seen? <laughs> you but don't you don't love, love your, your neighbor right. that you have seen. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. And so uh, to add a little addendum. So dad has, dad's been very popular for a, a particular sermon series that he preached for most of my life. Was love God, <laughs> love God, and love people. He preached and, it for twenty uh, years straight. Yes. But it, it's love God and love people. He wouldn't shut up. <laughs> but a, a little addendum to that: love God and love people. Well, that oh. that loving people, there is a clause that's contingent on how you love yourself. So, yeah. so there's all part of it. It's it's like a. If, if I think as I wrap up, as we wrap up the conversation, I want to maybe talk to the person who's watching this episode that maybe you've been feeling convicted over whether or not I should actually buy that set of golf clubs and go out with my friends because maybe I would be, maybe that would be a sin. Hey, no, no, I, I wouldn't because I particularly don't like golf. I don't want to go chase a ball for three hours. And you'd end up cussing. Right. You, I, you wouldn't worship God out there. You'd no, I would not. Throwing clubs. It would not fill my tank in the least to go out and play golf. But <laughs> if it does for you. <laughs> go play golf. Yes. Enjoy it. Enjoy the beautiful weather. Enjoy right. the beautiful greenery and the grass and worship God while you do and it. Friendship. And maybe even share the gospel while right. you're out there and get a chance to do it. Go enjoy your life. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I think that's the point that we're getting at here. Jesus shows us an example in Mark of what it means to get away. And this actually follows, it actually follows the scene where they're talking about the Sabbath. And, and so, so yeah. we have Mark is laying out this sort of uh, argument in a way through the, through the life of Jesus of the, there's a principle here. And that is, you gotta, you've got to take care of yourself and you have to rest. And, and, yeah. and God cares about the health of the man. Like you see yes. that played out. And, and can I add there? Mm -hmm. So rest is about the health of the man. Yeah. Hebrews teaches us that the rest is in the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. We're a whole man. We're not just physical. We're spiritual. Right. So the difference in a secular view of self-care rest is they're only looking at the physical. Right. We are looking at the spiritual. The greatest rest we will find is in our devotion with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we don't take time away from our time with him. Right. Uh, even when I go on vacation, man, go to Hawaii and enjoy it. Have a blast. Good friend of mine goes to Hawaii, I think, three weeks every summer, and I'm so super excited. Go there, enjoy it. Does yeah. some ministry while he's there. One thing I know about my buddy Mm -hmm. He ain't letting that devotion with the Lord go because right. we're more than just a, a body, but, mm. but the spirit within us has to have that rest and the Holy spirit of God. We have entered into right. that rest. The well, best way to rest is to let the Holy spirit fill you. 
I am about to go into overtime for a second because I just had a thought that I I think we ought to, we ought to talk about. Yes. So often we forget the we forget to find where we find our <laughs> to to find where the source of our strength comes from. Yeah. And so I know this is is the case for many people. In fact, you're probably probably somebody watching this is that you've experienced this when we serve in ministry, especially if like, you know, you're serving either past in a pastoral role, or maybe even you're serving in like teaching Sunday school or you're running the nursery or you're out in the parking lot, helping walk people from their cars. And you're, you're serving in some way in the Sunday service. So often those people end up getting neglected when it comes time for their spiritual devotion because they spend all of Sunday running around between multiple services and, and making sure the campus is clean and making sure that this person is where they're supposed to be and making sure that, that the programs get, you know, executed properly. And at the end of the day, you could spend years serving in that capacity and have neglected that time alone with the Lord. That is where you're going to find strength. It's where you're going to find, the the that joy to replenish you and and to keep you to keep you going. So, I would just say, if you're serving in ministry, be careful to look and see: Am I serving in ministry, and is that just become a, a box that I'm checking yeah. of Christian duty, or are you actually doing it because you're joyfully serving the Lord? And if you're yeah. doing if you're doing these things just to check off boxes then you probably need to reevaluate because you're not doing them for the joy of, for the joy of serving. Amen. Right. And if you're not doing it for the joy of serving, you need to, you need, it's time to get in back in balance. It's time to Amen. spend time with the Lord and get replenished. Get yeah. renewed. Come on, come on, Martha. Come on to the feet of Jesus with yes. Mary every once exactly. in a while. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, I guess we've, we've pretty much, uh, <laughs> we've pretty much, Beat we this run. horse to death. <laughs> I think so. Man, yeah. I sure enjoyed it. I loved it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope that this will inspire you. Can I say a word of prayer Absolutely. as we close here? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you will impact the heart of everyone who may be watching or listening to this podcast. Lord, they're so tired. They're so weary. They're so exhausted. Life has beat them up. They have cared for people and felt like nobody cared back, and they're sick of it. They're exhausted. They're, they've got fatigue. They're walking as a zombie, just kind of going through the motions. And I pray, Holy Spirit, move in their heart right now. Draw them to a place of rest and refreshing, that they would cast their cares upon you for you. You care for us. And dear Lord, that they would look to that rock that is higher than we are. And they would lift their eyes to you and find the strength that only comes from you. I pray you'll empower us and use us and let us find the joy of the journey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Love Amen. you, everyone. Absolutely. Well, if you are still watching to the end of this, number one, I hope this, this episode really spoke to you, helped you. And uh, you're going to hopefully say something that you might even return back to and um, and let it encourage you. If you would, it'd be a huge help for us if you would hit the little like button right underneath this video. Um, that helps more people find these videos and um, and maybe be a help in their life. So if you could uh, do a little do a little to help us and a little to help maybe that person who wants to see this video. So that's right. Do it. Hit the like button for us. And um We'll see you guys in our next episode. Love you.